Yeah, so welcome to the, the EVA Hockey USA Coaches Introduction Chats. Um, I'm Chris Bowen, co-founder and director of the company. And with us, we've got Omar Shibley, who's also the co-founder and director. Um, big thing about Evo is we, we are very passionate about connecting the best players and coaches from around the world with youth players. And we're very fortunate to have Susanna Townsend, MBE, with us. Um, you know, just to go through a few of your accolades, two-time Olympian, Olympic gold medalist Rio 2016, Olympic bronze medalist Tokyo 2020, European Championship gold medalist, European Championships bronze medalist, two-time Commonwealth Games medalist silver and bronze, and with a combined 188 international caps for Great Britain and England. So, Susanna, welcome to the chat. I'm happy you know my uh, my stats. <laughs> like when people ask me, I'm like, I don't actually know. There's a few medals here and there, but no, no, thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. I mean, let's let's start from the very beginning and and tell us about the the gold medal, um, the experience, the games, everything. Well, we um we are a team that have been together really for years, and without realizing it, it well. The amount of time you spend with people, you get to know them on and off the pitch, which for me, I'm a, I'm a great believer that if you really get to know people off it, you can, it translates very well on the hockey pitch as well. And, and we are a team, the, the girls beforehand, they won a bronze medal in London. And then for a new Olympic cycle, we, we were obviously aiming to, to do a little bit better. And, and it's not always plain sailing. It's not always, you're not going to win all of the time. And, and we, for a couple of years, we, we weren't doing that well, actually. And in 2014, we came home from a tournament where we, we weren't successful. And we said, look, if we're going to win this medal, if we're going to be able to look in the mirror and say we've done absolutely everything we can to achieve this gold medal, what's it going to be about? And what are our values and our visions going to be? And, and we came up with the vision, inspire the future, be the difference, create history. And none of that was really about winning. All of that was about Simple things, thanking your coaches after training, picking up the balls, making eye contact when you're on the training pitch and off it. And, and all of these things were actually discussed as a squad. And, and for us going into that Olympic Games, we, we, we'd had a very, very good couple of years. We won the Europeans. We, we knew we were good. And but the whole reason that we were so good is that we are an exceptionally good team. And, we had a group of individuals that were willing to work incredibly hard for each other. Every single person in on the pitch and off the pitch, that was a squad of 32 and staff, knew what their roles were. And, and fundamentally, we believed in ourselves. And, and actually going to that Olympic Games, I, I missed out on going to London. And it was, a real, it was a tough sort of time for me to get over. But how, having said that, actually, it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my career. Because... and. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to go through that to realize really what you need to do. And, and I looked at myself quite hard and quite hard and said, look, just do the things that the coaches tell you. Listen when people are talking to you. Work on the things you're not very good at because naturally we all want to work on the things we're good at. And, and that's pretty much what I did to get myself selected. And, and I went from not going to an Olympic Games to, to pretty much getting selected for every game from that point forward. So, the team that actually went to Rio, we honestly, we were a group of mates that had a really good time that worked hard for each other. It's, it's that simple. Can, can I ask you, there's a couple of things from what, from what you just said that are really interesting. One, when you were talking about the principles that were set, who, who were the drivers behind that? So was it players? Was it coaches? Was there anyone specific that kind of in, enforced that? that that's the to first yeah, no, to be honest, it was, it was everyone. And, and sport's tough. Like when you don't do very well, it, it's tough and you're constantly being, being looked at to perform. And everyone that's watching this, you know that feeling. And we all turn up every day intending to do our best. And sometimes it just doesn't, it doesn't quite click. And, and actually we knew we were good at hockey. The hockey wasn't the problem. It was the conversations and the things we had to do off the pitch that made us, that would make us a good team. And, and naturally, that's led by initially by coaches, by sports psychologists. But, but actually, if every single person then buys into it, it means that you're, you're going to get a, a greater effect. And, and leadership for me, leadership isn't necessarily just your captain. It's not your vice captain. It's, it's every single person leads in their own way. And, 
And I never had a title within the squad. I wasn't in the leadership group. I, but I, I was known for leading in the way that I played. I was known for leading in a way that when a new youngster turned up to training as an 18 year old, I, I put my arm around her and make sure she wasn't nervous. And I think, yes, who, who led it initially? It was from the coaches, but actually every single person bought into it and, and led in their own way and, and actually drove it in their own way as well. And, and we wouldn't have agreed on this vision and these values if every single person hadn't agreed to them. And because of that, every single person has a voice and, and it's not, and we've all been a part of meetings where you're a part of a meeting, you're clock watching and you want to get out. These meetings we wanted to be in, we wanted to be in. And actually, if you think of, you think of sport, you think of businesses, a lot of people, they, you get given a pamphlet, for example, when you, when you turn up to a new job with your values and your vision. And nobody understands what they are. No one actually reads them. No one takes the time. We made it a part of our everyday language. We made it something that it didn't have to be these big meetings. It simply was, we would use this language every day that meant that it was so habitual that you get to an Olympic Games and that is already part of your identity. Amazing. One of the, the, the other thing you talked about overcoming that disappointment from London and then that incredible comeback through to, to Rio. Was there a point where you were just like, I, I just want to pack this in. I've, I've had enough. And, and if, did you ever get to that point and how did you overcome that? To be honest, from like from 2012 to 2016, no, because I knew that if I didn't go to the next Olympics, it would be because I wasn't good enough. And I know that sounds like a really simple thing to say. I, I know that prior to that in London 2012, I, I couldn't have said that because, and it's really simple, but I literally didn't work in things I wasn't very good at and people kept telling me and, so for me, that period, I was fit, I was fast, I was really enjoying it, and I put myself in the best space to actually to actually go to that Olympic Games and do well. I think the tough time for me was probably after that, when you then flip it, I got a little bit older, everyone got faster, everyone got a little bit fitter, it became a lot more tough, I had a few more injuries, and those were the periods when I thought, can I really do this? And and there was certainly a period in, in around 2018 where I just kept on getting injured. And there was not, I was playing every single game injured. And, and I always said to myself, if I stop enjoying it, I will stop. And, and it did cross my mind. And that, that scared me at the time. And, and for me, and I, and I actually surrounded myself by some really good people. And I said, look, what's, what do I really want to achieve here? And I took a bit of a reset and I thought, look, just sort out your injuries maybe don't go on a tour, <laughs> take yourself away from it from a little bit and really, really figure out how you're going to get to that Olympic Games. And and I, my hand on my heart, I always say my biggest achievement in my career is almost going to the Tokyo Olympics. I almost love that medal more than my gold medal because the, the journey to get there for me was so much harder. And it's a, it's a really hard thing to explain, but being able to actually go to an Olympic Games and you look back on it and you think, okay, Yes, I worked hard for the, for the real one, but it was, but it was easier for me because I was in the prime, prime of my life. Everything was sort of going right. I had the confidence and I hadn't had really any setbacks apart from not going to an Olympic Games. And the Tokyo cycle for me, that was a lot tougher because I had to find something within myself that you have, we talk about being able to give yourself confidence and you're not just allowing, you're not just relying on your coaches and people to be able to give it to you. And I had to find that, I really did. And, and that's why when I look back on my career, genuinely standing on that podium in Tokyo was probably my biggest achievement. On, on the, the theme of setbacks, like you mentioned it previously, what advice could you, could you give to any players that are, you know, that are, are going through this, no matter what age they are, you know, selection is tough. Um, you know, so, so reflecting on how you dealt with setbacks, what advice could you offer players coming through at the moment um, in dealing with these situations? Yeah, the thing is, it's you're going to have setbacks. And I'm a, I'm a believer that if you, if you don't, you're sort of not learning and you're not putting yourself in that space to really test yourself. And, and feedback, my biggest advice to anyone is, is figure out how you like to receive feedback firstly, if, if it's, and articulate that to the people around you. And, and that's simple things like if you don't stop a ball, 
if your teammate next to you is saying, oh, Susanna, make sure you stop that ball. That, for me personally, that's not going to help me. If someone says, look, Susanna, drop your right hand a little bit lower, maybe bend your knees, really watch it onto your stick. That's the type of feedback that, that I like to actually have. And, and I know it's, it's, it's such a little thing, but we all react very differently off how people talk to us, the situation in our personal lives. And, and actually, if you have those things in your head and you articulate that to those around you, then, then every single person can help you as well. And, the biggest thing for me is actually realizing that it's, it's tough. It's really tough. But actually, the, it's, it, all of those tough moments are worth it. My greatest moments in my career are, are waking up early on a January morning and it's freezing cold and doing a running session with my teammates. We think of success as just medals. And actually, the, a lot of the successes are those moments that you actually get to enjoy. And, and I actually read um, something on LinkedIn this morning, weird, strangely, and it was a guy called Jack Green who uh, was an Olympic runner. And he was talking, he was, his question to himself on LinkedIn was pretty much, what would, I ta- what would I say to a younger Jack? And one of the things was just realize that it is going to be tough, but the journey is going to be worth it. And, and actually, it's, a, it's for me when I look back and think of what I've achieved yes the medals are incredible and I'm very fortunate that I can sit here and have those medals but part of the journey is the setbacks part of the journey are the really are the really tough times part of the journey is winning of course but you have to enjoy all of those processes to actually get there because those are the moments you remember most so let's talk about how did you guys can you describe to us how you guys prepared what was like a a weekly build up here, training wise, um, you know, meetings, you mentioned about, you know, how you like to take on feedback. Was that communicated in an open, within an open group? Um, you know, can you, can you paint the picture for us how you guys prepared on and off the pitch in the lead up to the Olympics and also, you know, to the, the gold medal game? Yeah. I mean, uh, in, in Great Britain, we have a centralized program. So we're, we're really fortunate that. We pretty much get to train together all the time and the environment's amazing because you also have other sports that are sort of dipping in and out of where you train. And, and we were pretty much together Monday to Friday. And with that, on a Wednesday, for example, you'd have maybe extra physio, you wouldn't have hockey, you'd have rehab sessions, but, but we tend to have like a couple of, a pitch session on a Monday and a gym in the afternoon, maybe some meetings thrown in and that would be different. That'd be nutrition, that'd be strength and conditioning, that would be, psychology it will be the stuff that I've talked about about values and and those will be little different things you'd also do your own video in that time because naturally you're all wanting to learn about your position that you're going to play and and actually learn about yourself as well and that format was was pretty similar throughout the rest of the week and and it was very very structured it's almost if you can sort of compare it it's a bit like being at school you have your timetable you know where you're going to be you know what you have to achieve, you know what stuff you have to bring and and that's how you sort of live your life and and people always laugh when you talk to, to someone, for example, that's got an office job and you say, look, I've got, I, I've, I train four hours a day, for example. And they're like, is that all you train? And you're like, well, yeah, but you're, you're training really hard and you've got all these meetings in between and actually in between that, you have to rest because rest is really important and so we talk about all these training that we do but actually even putting in rest into your calendar. And for example, on a Tuesday evening, when you've maybe got Wednesday morning off, having to, to make those decisions of, do I go for dinner with a friend that I haven't seen? Is it going to help my performance the next day? It's, those are the things that you continuously ask yourself. And, and actually, I grew up in, um, uh, with my family. And my dad, for example, picked me up at two minutes past midnight when I was 16 because I had England under 16 training five days later and and that's a really tough thing to do as a kid because but actually for me those decisions were really easy because again I articulated it to every single person around me and so then we go back to that Olympic Games and I think how did we as a squad prepare and and all of us we asked the question every single day is this going to help us win a gold medal it's never I is this going to help us win a gold medal and when you make a decision that's going to actually impact every single person around you as well as yourself. I don't know about sort of everyone listening, but for me, that has far greater effects, actually. And you, you never want to let your teammates down. And, 
when we went to that Olympic Games, we our opening game was against Australia. And we went to Australia in February because we traditionally always struggled against Australia. And we played five test games. And we actually lost the series. However, we figured out how to beat Australia. And we came out really confident because we knew how to play against them. And it was always quite daunting playing against them because for people that watch Australian, especially Australian hockey, that their press is really aggressive. They're really in your face. You, but if you get past that, maybe that first line, you're away. And we learned how to play against them. Now, we won our opening game at the Olympics. And it's really, again, it's such a small little detail. Winning that that opening game at the Olympics set us up to be successful. And again, the language was never, we're going to go and try and win this Olympic Games. It was just an unspoken thing of, if we go through our processes, we're going to put ourselves in the best chance possible to win. And you go through that Olympic Games and you're, you're winning, you keep on winning. You're like, oh my goodness, we're still winning. And it there's, there's two ways of looking at this. It was an incredibly hard Olympics. However, we completely had that confidence from ourselves, from our coaches, that, that we were in the exact right spot at the exact right time. And we were doing everything we possibly could to actually go and win it. And, and I remember walking out on that Olympic, um, in the Olympic final. And yes, I'm, I'm human, so I had nerves. But, but at the same time, none of us really did because we, we, we thought to ourselves, for the first time, really, we can really do this and we can really beat them. And... And individually, Holland, we played Holland in the final. Individually, Holland are an incredible, they're incredible. Player for player, they're incredible. As are we. But the thing that set us apart from them is that we were an exceptionally good team, again, who worked incredibly hard for each other. And, and actually, sometimes in a team sport, you have to take your ego out. You have to do what's right for the team. You're not going to take on 10 players and try and score a goal. You have to maybe pass it to the back post so someone else can score. And all of us are very happy to do that. I can't tell you who scored the goals in the game, but I can tell you how it felt being as a part of that team. And for me, that's far more important. And that's probably why I was a midfielder, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> so just just reflecting on nerves and and the whole experience, how 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 do you personally, how have you dealt with nerves? Has it ever been a factor for you, positive, negative? And what sort of like, you know, coping mechanisms did you incorporate in your, your playing career? I've been quite fortunate that I've never really, I've never suffered too much with it. Um, and actually that got misinterpreted as a kid as that being arrogant. And it wasn't me being arrogant. It was just, I always, I was always sort of okay. And, but I found myself being nervous when I haven't prepared properly. So if there's ever been a day or a period in my life where I haven't, you can relate it to anything, to meetings, to, to, to running, to being on a hockey pitch. If you don't prepare, you naturally feel nervous because you're the one that's let yourself down. And actually, that's how I felt if I hadn't maybe done that small little thing that could have made that difference. And, and my way of coping with it genuinely was to prepare better. So to prepare better so that if I did have a bad game or I did not do very well on the fitness test. I could still say, but I've done everything I could do to get here. So something else has gone wrong around it. And and I had, if you, for example, if you think of nerves, even on a hockey pitch, if I wasn't playing well, I'd have a couple of people around me that would, that would really help me out. So Laura Unsworth, one of my teammates, if I'd mistrapped a couple of balls, she'd get me on the ball really quickly again, just for an in-out pass to reset me. And And that was something that my team and I knew to get me back. And... And actually, so it's not these the big things that you need to change. It's finding these little things that you can do really quickly to reset yourself. And but my my greatest thing that I sort of taught myself was to was to just to prepare really really well. And I only ever had myself to blame if I didn't. And and that's something that I had to own myself. And it's something that I really try and teach a lot of kids because, and especially people growing up now and sort of where there's so many more distractions than when I was growing up. It's genuinely own what you want to achieve and and tell the people around you what you want to achieve and, and those people around you are gonna are gonna help you, they're gonna support you, they're gonna they're gonna be the ones that genuinely enhance you. And and I was very lucky when I was growing up especially that I had people around me that that genuinely saw this talent and instead of giving me a hard time for not going on the, the Ibiza party when I was seventeen. 
they were still my friends and and those things make a huge difference and the best thing that I ever did is that I, I genuinely owned what I wanted to achieve. So I mean you've you've been very fortunate to be you know coached by some incredible people uh, you know across your career um in your your view what makes a what makes a good coach and what's some of the best advice that you've ever received from from coaches over your career what makes a great coach um firstly i think it's i think it's different for everyone and but for me a great coach is also someone who has the ability to to listen and really understand their players and and I naturally am a terrible defender. Naturally terrible. If I if I think of technically how I defend, abysmal. However, and and I knew this. I, I knew this because I kept on being given that feedback for years and years and years. And that wasn't helping me because I'd become actually more anxious about my defending. And um Karen Brown, I had a coach called Karen Brown who said to me, Look, Susanna, you're not gonna tackle like that person. You're not going to tackle like the textbook way, but you read the game incredibly well to make defending work for you. And we did. And from that point on, my whole defensive mindset changed because instead of trying to do what the person next to me did, I found a way that worked for me. And and I think about that moment a lot when I coach because I think we all try and do something in the exact same way that someone else is. But actually, coaches that take the time to find a way to to deliver that really key message that that changed my defensive career and so I don't really have an answer in terms of what makes a great coach for me it's it's genuinely taking the time to understand your athletes and and coaches are going to get it wrong because you do and in the heat of the moment people do however if if we have that empathy if we we have the ability to take the time to listen to actually see what's in front of us then then those are the ones that make good coaches who have genuinely got the the ability to adapt, and and that's where I found I got the best from the people that have actually coached me. Can, can I ask you, without going too much into detail of it, what was that adjustment, or what if there's any yeah, attacking so players out there who maybe struggle with that side of it? So instead of being low, for example, I my I just could never get low and do a two hand attack on the floor ever. Still haven't my whole career, <laughs> and. Um, so I would figure out, let's say, for example, you've got a, you're defending someone that's, that's a right midfielder near the sideline, for example. I would stay on my forehand for as long as possible. Because I was fast, I'd then take the ball off them instead of going. So little simple things like that. And I would try and think, and I, I did a lot of sort of analysis of other teams. So I'd really watch what players did. So I'd learn about what my opponents would do, naturally would do. So instead of thinking, okay, how am I going to tackle this? I would, I would tend to make them almost pass it to me in a way, or I'd figure out where they're going to go to intercept it or force it into another position. I didn't necessarily end up still making a lot of tackles, but people behind me would know where I was going to position so that they could step up and make the tackle. And I was okay with that because actually my strength was reading where the ball was going to go. So it's, for some of us, it's, some of us don't get low. <laughs> I've tried my best throughout my career and I, I never have. So actually it was really stick to my strengths with this. I'm fast and fit. My eyes are always up. I've got good vision, not just good vision in defence, not just good vision in attack and defence as well. And and use those strengths and, and use them to actually make them good at, at something else other than what your actual super strengths are. So is, is this an example of sort of coach guiding you as to where to go, but then you actually taking that ownership that you were talking about earlier and looking at the video and look, figuring out the solutions yourself, but guided by your coach. Yeah, no, exactly. And because you, you can't always get the answers, you have to figure out what works for you. And that's always going to be, that's always going to be different. And, and I genuinely, my, when I finished my career, I would almost call myself a defensive midfielder and I loved it. And uh, Danny Carey once said to me, Susanna, if you, if you, if you tackle, you get to get the ball and attack. And I was like, oh my goodness, you're so right. And that made it more exciting for me instead of just being, and, and I know it again, it's, it's a really tiny little detail, but the change in, in mindset for me, literally, it's like speaking to a five year old. Oh, if you, if you get that, you get that. It's like risk versus reward. And, and it still worked for me as an adult because what, what excited me was genuinely being able to attack. But because 
over time, I got better at my way of defending, not necessarily a way that everyone defends, but my way of defending, it really, really excited me. And it excited me because I figured out, actually, that is my super strength. And, and yes, it was told, I was told, this is sort of the route you need to go down. However, I had to own it myself. Amazing. So what, can I ask, what, what advice would you give to, to young players at, at three stages here? So you've got the complete beginner who's just starting out playing hockey for the first time. Um, you know, the next one that's breaking through rep- representative hockey now. They're being selected for teams, whether that's regional, international, whatever it is. And then the last thing, what sort of advice would you, could you offer a player who's, you know, established in a national representative setup? What advice could you offer them about staying motivated and pushing on to the next stage? Well, firstly, when I started hockey, I hated it. So if you've just started and your back hurts and everything hurts, that's okay. I I genuinely did not want to play hockey. Um, Even asked my mum to write me a sick note. And... But, but I ended up finding so much enjoyment through, through simply being with my friends and, and actually something to tell every single, like everyone in what you've just mentioned is from being at school and shouting your school name to being on an Olympic final shouting your country name, it feels the exact same way because fundamentally you're doing it with people you like, you're having a really good time. No one else in the world knows what's happening in that huddle. It's completely yours. And that for me is actually one of the most important things because we a lot of us lose sight of that. And and I've been very fortunate that I, I never have lost sight of that. And but if I think of people starting out, it's enjoy it. Like enjoy the process of getting good, enjoy the process of, of messing up, enjoy every single little bit of it, the friendships and and actually it's like anyone that hasn't let's say after Christmas when we all go back to the gym. And our bodies hurt a bit more and it's all a little bit tougher. And then you start to get a little bit fitter and you see that those effects. When you're learning a new sport, you see, you see a change very, very quickly. And that's nice. So really, really jump on that. Jump on that and enjoy seeing that transition. I think if you've got someone that's sort of just in the system, there, you're with your friendship groups, you've got more people coming in, you've got, you're competing for selection, you haven't necessarily established yourself yet. Really figure out what your super strengths are. Figure out, look, I'm having a really bad day. What's the one thing I can bring today? If everything else fails, what's the one thing I can bring? And as long as you can bring that, you still had a good day. And, and that doesn't necessarily need to be actually how you are as a hockey player. It's how you are as a person as well, which is as important. And then I think lastly, if you're just written in the setup and you've been around for a long time, it's, don't just rest on your laurels and naturally sometimes we do it and and I had a couple of years or a year where I wasn't actually playing very well and and I and I won't make any excuses I, I took my foot off the gas for, for probably about a year and I had a lot of injuries it just like we mentioned earlier it just, it just became a little bit too hard and for me, I, I definitely lost the enjoyment from that but but actually what what was the difference in the turning point for me was that that I simply stopped working on the things that I needed to work on. And coaches kept selecting me, rightly or wrongly, and they shouldn't have selected me. But actually, I should have said to myself, Susanna, you're letting yourself down. And for me, it's always make sure, especially when you get a little bit older, keep on working on all the little things that you don't think you need to work on anymore. And the simple things actually they're the things that are the best things for us to work on. And we can, we want to be the person that can do a million tricks. We want to be the person that that can show off, but actually keep working on the really simple things because those are the things you're always going to have. And, and coaches like consistency. Coaches like players that are consistent, that they know what they deliver every single day when they turn up to training, when they turn up to an international match. So one thing that, that I think is, is terribly overrated or underrated, sorry, is, is, the use of the word be consistent. And if you're consistent and you know what you bring every single day, then then coaches will find it very hard not to select you. That's awesome. If, if me personally, I, I can reflect on that from a personal perspective just through my coaching journey and, and still apply certain things. Like, you know, go back to basics, 
do the simple things well, you know, consistency, etc. Obviously, we're going out to to the US uh, in the next couple of couple of months. Um, yeah, let us know how you're feeling about it. Um, yeah, any thoughts in, in in the lead up to us going out there? Yeah, well, I've, I've I've coached in the US before in Philadelphia, which was really cool, and I loved it because I mean, everyone was so excited just to be there and play hockey and the willingness to learn in America it's it's incredible and for me what makes a good hockey player or a good athlete or any anything in life it's it's people that work hard it's people that turn up with a smile on their face and really really want to get stuck in and and the one thing that I, that I can certainly promise on behalf of sort of Evo is that we're going to work hard and we're going to have a really good time and that's that's how I've always had my career always always had that in the back of my mind throughout my career. Work hard, but smile whilst you're doing it. And and I think for us going out, going out to America, we we want to make you guys better hockey players. We want to have fun as coaches. And and if we both are able to give that as coaches and as athletes, then then everyone will go home smiling from our camp. Awesome. Well, that concludes the first chat we've had. Um, but thanks very much for your time. Um, really looking forward to working with you again, uh, this time in, in the US. Um, and yeah, thanks very much for sharing your, your experiences and looking forward to it. Cool. Well, yeah, we'll see you, see you soon, everyone. <laughs>